Metro, 2033, Dmitry Glukhovsky, Chapter 17, The Children of the Worm. Several minutes passed in total darkness, and Artyom, having deciding that they had left them alone, began to pull himself up, trying at least to sit. His tightly tied legs and hands were numb and sore. Artyom recalled the words of his stepfather explaining to him once that even leaving a bandage or tourniquet on too long could kill the skin. Although it seemed to him that it didn't matter now, enemy lay quietly. A voice rang out, drawn will spit a paralyzing needle. It's not necessary. Artyom froze obediently. You don't have to shoot. He had a glimmer of hope. Perhaps he could convince his jailer to help him get out. But how can you talk to a savage who barely understands you? And who is this great worm? He asked the first thing that came to his head. The great worm makes the earth. He makes the world. He makes man. The great worm is everything. The great worm is life. The enemies of the great worm, the people of the machines, are death. I have never heard of him, Artyom said, choosing his words carefully. Where does he live? The great worm lives here, next to us, around us. The great worm digs all the passages. Then man said he does it. No, the great worm. He gives life. He takes life. He digs new passages. The people live in them. Good people honor the great worm. Enemies of the great worm want to kill him. That is what say the priests. Who are those priests? Old people with hair on their head. Only they can. They know. They listen to the desires of the great worm and they tell the people. Good people do it thus. Bad people do not obey. Bad people are enemies. The good eat them. Recalling the overheard conversation, Artyom began gradually to comprehend what was what. The old man relating the legend of the worm was probably one of those priests. The priest says, It is forbidden to eat people. He says the great worm will cry when one man eats another. Artyom reminded him, trying to express his thoughts exactly as the savage would. It is against the will of the great worm to eat people. If we stay here, they will eat us. The great worm will be sad, he will cry, he added carefully. Of course the great worm will cry, a derisive voice was heard from the darkness. But emotions are emotions, and you will not replace a protein food in a ration with anything. It was that same old man speaking. Artyom recognized his timbre and intonation. Only he didn't know if he had been in the room all the time, or had just stolen in unnoticed. I didn't matter. He wasn't going to get out of the cell now. Then another thought entered Artyom's head, and it chilled him. How lucky that Anton had not come round yet and wasn't hearing this. And the child, the children that you steal, do you eat them too, the boy, Oleg? He asked almost soundlessly, staring into the darkness with eyes open wide from fear. We do not eat little ones, the savage replied, although Artyom thought the old man was answering. Little ones cannot be evil. They cannot be enemies. We take little ones in order to explain how to live. We talk about the great worm. We teach them to honor him. Good boy, drone, the priest said. Favorite student, he explained. What happened to the boy you stole last night? Where is he? It was your monster who dragged him away, I know, Artyom said. Monster! And just who brought forth these monsters? The old man exploded. Who brought forth these mute, three-eyed, armless, six-fingered things who died during birth and are unable to reproduce? Who deprived them of human appearance, promised them paradise, and flung them to die in the blind gut of this cursed city? Who is to blame for this, and who is the real monster? Artyom was silent. The old man said no more and only breathed heavily, trying to calm down. And Anton finally came to, Where is he? He said in a hoarse voice, Where is my son? Where is my son? Give me my son! He began to scream and, trying to get free, began to roll about the floor, hitting the bars of the cage, then the wall. Violent, the old man remarked in his former derisive tone. Drone, calm him. A strange sound was heard, as if someone had coughed. Something whistled through the air, and Anton was calm again after several seconds. Very instructive, the priest said. I will go and bring the boy, let him see his papa, and say goodbye. A good laddie, by the way, his pop can be proud of him, 
He resists hypnosis so well. He began to shuffle along the floor, and then the door creaked. No need to fear, the jailer softly said unexpectedly. Good people do not kill. They do not eat the children of enemies. Little ones do not sin. It is possible to learn to live well. The great worm forgives young enemies. My God, just what is this great worm? This is completely absurd. Worse than non-believers and Satanists. How can you believe in him? Has anyone ever seen him? Your worm. Have you seen him or something? Artyom tried for sarcasm, but lying on the floor with his arms and legs tied didn't make it easy. Just as when he had been waiting in prison to be hanged, he became indifferent to his own fate. He put his head on the cold floor and closed his eyes, expecting an answer. It is forbidden to look at the great worm. Banned, the savage snapped. And such a thing cannot be, Artyom replied reluctantly. There is no worm, and people made the tunnels. They all are shown on maps. There is even a round one where Hansa is, and only people can build round ones. I don't suppose you even know what a map is. I know, Drone said quietly. I study with the priest, he shows us. There are not many passages on the map. The great worm has been making new passages, and they aren't on the map. Even here, our home, there are new passages, sacred ones, and they are not on the map. The people of the machines make the maps. They think they dig the passages. Stupid, proud. They don't know anything. The great worm punishes them for this. Oh, why does he punish them? Artyom didn't understand. For our arrogance, the savage articulated carefully. For arrogance, confirmed the voice of the priest. The great worm made man last, and man was his favorite offspring. For he did not give intellect to the others, but gave it to man. He knew that intellect is a dangerous toy, and therefore he ordered, Live in the world with yourself, in the world with the earth, in the world with life and all creatures, and honor me. After this, the great worm went to the very bowels of the earth, but said beforehand, The day will come, and I shall return. Behave as if I were with you. And the people obeyed their creator, and lived in the world with the earth he had created, and in the world with each other, and in the world with the other creatures, and they honored the great worm. And they bore children, and their children bore children, and from father to son, from mother to daughter, they handed down the words of the great worm. But those who had heard his order with their own ears died, and their children died, and many generations were replaced, and the great worm has not yet returned. And then, one after the other, people stopped observing his covenants, and did as they wanted. And there appeared those who said, There never was a great worm, and there is not now. And others expected that the great worm would return and punish them. He would burn them with the light of his eyes, devour their bodies, and cause the passages where they lived to crumble. But the great worm has not returned, and has only cried for the people. And his tears have risen up from the depths and flooded the lower passages. But those who have turned from their creator have said, No one created us. We always have been. Man is beautiful and mighty. He cannot have been created by an earthworm. And they said, All the earth is ours, and was ours, and will be. And the great worm did not make the passages in it, but we and our ancestors. And they lit the fire and began to kill the creations which the great worm had created, saying, Here, all the life that is around is ours, and everything here is only to satisfy our hunger. And they created machines in order to kill more quickly, in order to sow death, in order to destroy the life created by the great worm and to subdue his world. But even then he did not rise up from the extreme depths to which he had gone. And they laughed and began to do more against that of which he had spoken. And they decided in order to degrade him, to build such machines that would replicate his likeness, and they created such machines, and they went inward in them, and they laughed. Here, they said, now we ourselves can rule as the great worm, and not as one, but as dozens. And the light strikes from our eyes, and the thunder rolls when we are creeping, and people leave their womb. We created the worm, and not the worm us. But even this was not enough for them. The hatred grew in their heart, and they decided to destroy the very earth where they lived. And they created thousands of different machines, 
that belched flame and spat iron and rendered the earth into parts. And they began to destroy the earth and every living thing that was in it. And then the great worm could not bear it, and he condemned them. He took from them their most valuable gift, intellect. Insanity overtook them. They turned their machines against each other and began to kill each other. And they no longer remembered why they did it and what they were doing, but they were unable to stop. Thus did the great worm punish man for his arrogance. But not everyone, a child's voice asked. No, there were those who always remembered the great worm and honored him. They renounced the machines and light and lived in the world with the earth. They were saved, and the great worm did not forget their loyalty, and he preserved their intellect, and he promised to give them the whole world when his enemies have fallen. And so shall it be, and it will be so, the savage and child repeated together. Oleg, Artyom called out, hearing something familiar in the child's voice. The child did not reply, and to this day the enemies of the great worm live in the passages burrowed by them, because there is nowhere else for them to take shelter. But they continue to worship, not him, but their machines. The patience of the great worm is enormous, and it has been sufficient for long centuries of human outrages. But even it is not eternal. It has been foretold that when he makes the last strike at the dark heart of the country of his enemies, their will shall be crushed, and the world will fall to the good people. It has been foretold that the hour shall come and the great worm will summon the rivers and the earth and the air for aid and the earthly layer will sink and the seething currents will rush and the dark heart of the enemy will rush to oblivion and then finally the just will triumph and there will be happiness for the good and life without diseases and fungi for one's heart's content and every kind of beast in abundance. A flame was lit. Artyom had succeeded in leaning his back against the wall, and now he no longer had to bend agonizingly in order to keep the people on the other side of the bars in his field of view. A small boy sat cross-legged on the floor in the middle of the room with his back to him. Over him loomed the withered figure of the priest, lit by the flame of the burning lighter in his hand. The savage with the blowpipe in his hands stood alongside, leaning against the door jamb. All eyes were fixed on the old man who had just finished his narrative. Artyom turned his head with difficulty and looked at Anton, who was fixed in that convulsive pose in which the paralyzing needle had caught him. He stared at the ceiling and was not able to see his son, but he certainly heard everything. Stand up, Sonny, and look at these people, said the priest. The boy immediately got to his feet and turned toward Artyom. It was Oleg. Go closer to him. Do you recognize any of them? The old man asked. Yes. The boy nodded affirmatively, looking sullenly at Artyom. It is my pop, and I was listening to your songs with this one, through the pipe. Your pop and his friend are bad people. They have been using machines and have been disparaging the great worm. Do you remember you told me and Uncle Vartan what your papa did when the bad people decided to destroy the world? Yes. Again, Oleg nodded. So tell us again. The old man placed the lighter into his other hand. My pop worked in the RVA, the rocket forces. He was a missile man. I wanted to be just like him, too, when I grow up. Artyom's throat dried up. How had he not been able to work out this riddle earlier? So that's where the lad had got that strange tab and so had declared that he was a missile man, just like the slain Tretyak. The coincidence was almost incredible. There remained in the whole metro people who had served in the rocket forces. And two of them had ended up in Kievskaya. Could this have been by chance? As a missile man, these people created greater evil for the world than all the rest put together. They sent machines and equipment that burnt and destroyed the earth and almost all life on it. The great worm forgives many who stray, but not those who gave the orders to destroy the world and sow death in it, and not those who carried it out. Your father has caused intolerable pain to the great worm. Your father destroyed our world with his own hands. Do you know what he deserves? The old man's voice had become stern. Death? The boy asked uncertainly, while glancing first at the priest and then at his father, doubled up on the floor of the monkey cage. Death, the priest confirmed. He must die. The sooner the evil people who have imparted pain to the great worm die, 
the sooner his promise will be fulfilled and the world will be reborn and delivered to the good people. Then Papa must die, concurred Oleg. That's the boy! The old man tenderly patted the boy on the head. And now run, play with Uncle Vartan and the kiddies again. Only look out, be careful in the darkness. Don't fall, drone, lead him and I'll sit some more for a while with them. Return in half an hour with the others and grab the sacks, we'll be ready. The light was extinguished. The swift rustling steps of the savage and the light tread of the child faded into the distance. The priest gave a cough and said to Artyom, I'll have a little chat here with you if you aren't opposed to it. We usually don't take captives unless they are children, and then they are all puny and born sickly. But we are seeing more and more adults who are deaf. I would be glad to talk with them, and maybe they would not mind, only, well, they eat them too quickly. Why then do you teach them that it is bad to eat people? Artyom asked. The worm will cry there, and so on. Well, how can I put it? It is for them in the future. For you, of course, you will miss this moment, and even me, too. But now the basis of a future civilization is being laid down of a culture which will live with nature in the world. Cannibalism is a necessary evil for them. There is nothing without animal protein, you see. But the legends will remain. And when the direct need to kill and stuff your face with those like you fades away, they will stop doing it. Only then will the great worm remember. It is unfortunate only to be living in this dandy time. The old man again began to laugh unpleasantly. You know I've already seen so many things in the metro, Artyom said. At one station they believe that if you dig deeply enough, you can dig all the way to hell. At another, that we already are living on the threshold of paradise, because the final battle of good and evil is over, and those who survived were chosen for entry into the heavenly kingdom. After that, the story about your worm doesn't sound all that convincing somehow. Do you at least believe in it yourself? What's the difference, what I or the other priests believe in? The old man grinned. You won't be alive much longer, just a few hours. So I'll just tell you something. One cannot be so frank with someone as with he who will carry all his revelations to the grave, so what I myself believe in is not important. The main thing is that the people believe. It is difficult to come to believe in a God whom I have created myself. The priest stopped for a short while, thinking, and then continued, How could I explain it to you? When I was a student, I studied philosophy and psychology at the university, although I doubt that's anything to you. And I had a professor, an instructor of cognitive psychology, a most knowledgeable man who laid out the intellectual process systematically. He was a real pleasure to listen to. And then I put to him a question, as all others do at that age. Does God exist? I had read various books, had conversations, as is customary, and I was inclined to the view that, most likely, he did not. And somehow I decided that this professor in particular, a great expert on the human soul, could answer for me precisely this question that so pained me. I went to see him in his office on the pretext of discussing a paper, and then I asked, in your opinion, Ivan Mikhalik, does God actually exist? Then he really surprised me. For me, he said, this question isn't worth asking. I myself was from a family of believers, used to the idea that he exists. From the psychological point of view, I did not try to analyze the truth because I did not want to. And generally, he said, for me it was not so much a question of knowledge based on principle as everyday behavior. My faith was not that I was sincerely convinced of the existence of a higher power, but that I was fulfilling the prescribed commandments. Praying at night and going to church, I would be better for it, more at peace, and that's it. The old man went silent. And what? Artyom couldn't contain himself. Whether I believe in the great worm or not isn't so very important. But commandments from divine lips live for centuries. Just one more thing. Create a god and teach his word. And believe me, the great worm is no worse than other gods and has survived many of them. Artyom closed his eyes. Neither Drawn nor the chief of this surprising tribe, nor even such strange creations as Vartan, had the slightest doubt that the great worm exists. For them it was a given, the only explanation of what they could see around them, the only authority for action and a measure of good and evil. 
What else could a man who had never seen anything except the Metro believe in? But there was in the legends of the worms something that Ardyom was still unable to understand. But why do you incite them so against machines? What's so bad about these mechanisms? Electricity, lighting, firearms, and so on? Your teachings mean that your people live without them, he said. What's bad about machines? The old man's tone changed dramatically. The good nature and patience with which he had just set forth his thoughts evaporated. You intend an hour before your death to preach to me the benefits of machines? Well, look around. Only a blind man won't notice that if mankind owed some kind of a debt, then he wouldn't rely so much on machines. How dare you snicker about the important role of equipment here at my station? You nobody! Art Yom hadn't expected his question, way less seditious than the previous about his belief in the great worm, to provoke such a reaction from the old man. Not knowing how to respond, he remained silent. The priest's heavy breathing could be heard in the darkness as he whispered some kind of curses and tried to calm himself. He resumed speaking only after several minutes. I am out of the habit of speaking with non-believers. Judging by the voice, the old man had regained control of himself. I got carried away in speaking with you. Something is keeping the young ones. They aren't bringing the sacks. He paused meaningfully. What sacks? Artyom responded to the ploy. They will prepare you. When I spoke of torture, I wasn't being strictly accurate. Pointless cruelty goes against the grain of the great worm. My colleagues and I, when we understood that cannibalism had taken root here and we could no longer do anything about it, decided to look after the culinary side of the problem. And so someone recalled that the Koreans, when they eat dogs, catch them alive, put them in sacks, and beat them to death with sticks. The meat benefits a lot from it. It becomes soft, tender. One man's multiple hematomas, as it were, are another man's cutlet. So don't judge us too severely. I myself would perhaps be happier to die first and then suffer the sticks. Inevitably, there will be internal bleeding. A recipe is a recipe. The old man even clicked the lighter in order to get a look at the effect he had produced. However, something is keeping them. It shouldn't have happened, he added. A whistle interrupted him. Artyom heard cries, running, children's crying, and that ominous whistle again. Something had happened at the station. The priest listened to the noise uneasily, then extinguished the fire and grew silent. Several minutes later, heavy boots began to rumble on the threshold, and a low voice murmured, Is anyone alive? Yes, we're here, Artyom and Anton, Artyom yelled at the top of his lungs, hoping that the old man had no pipes with poisoned needles hanging around his neck. Here they are! Cover me and the lad! Someone screamed. There was a dazzling bright flash of light. The old man dashed towards the exit, but a man barring the way hit him in the neck. The priest began to wheeze and fell. The door! Hold the door! Something had come crashing down, plaster began to fall from the ceiling, and Artyom blinked. When he opened his eyes, two men were now standing in the room. They were not run-of-the-mill soldiers, and Artyom hadn't seen anyone like them before. Dressed in heavy, long, bulletproof vests over tailored black uniforms, both were armed with unusual short machine guns with laser gun sights and silencers. In addition, massive titanium helmets with face guards like the Hansa Spetsnaz and large titanium shields with eye slits added to the impressive sight. A flamethrower was visible on the back of one. They quickly inspected the room, illuminating it with a long and inconceivably strong flashlights that were shaped like cudgels. These? One of them asked. Them? The other confirmed. Efficiently examining the lock on the door of the monkey cage, the first moved back, took several steps and leapt, striking the cage with his boots. The rusty hinges broke and the door collapsed half a foot from Art Yom. The man lowered himself onto one knee in front of Artyom and lifted his face guard. Everything now fell into place. Melnik was looking at Artyom through squinted eyes. His wide serrated knife slipped along the wires entangling Artyom's legs and hands. Then the stalker cut the wire that had been binding Anton. Alive, Melnik remarked with satisfaction. Can you walk? Artyom began to nod, but was unable to lift himself to his feet. His numbed body was still not totally under his command. Several more men ran into the room. Two of them immediately took up a defensive position at the doors. 
There were eight fighters in all in the party. They were dressed and equipped just like those who had stormed into the room, but several of them wore long leather cloaks, as Hunter had. One of them lowered a child to the ground, covering him with the shield he wore on his arm. The child immediately raced into the cell and bent over Anton. Papa! Papa! I lied to them so they'd think I was on their side. I showed them where you are. Forgive me, Papa! Papa, don't be silent! The boy could hardly contain his tears. Anton looked at the ceiling with glassy eyes. Artyom was frightened that two paralyzing needles in a day could turn out to be too much for the watch commander. Melnik placed his index finger on Anton's neck. He's okay, he concluded after several seconds. He's alive! Bring a stretcher! While Artyom talked about the impact of the poison needles, two fighters unrolled a cloth stretcher on the floor and loaded Anton onto it. On the floor, the old man began to stir and mumble something. And who's this? Melnik asked. And having heard from Artyom the explanation said, We'll take him with us and use him as cover. How's the situation? All quiet, reported a fighter guarding the entrance door. Let's get back to the tunnel, the stalker said. We have to return to base with the wounded and the hostage for interrogation. Here you go. He threw Artyom a machine gun. If all goes as planned, you won't have to use it. You don't have any armor, so you'd better stay under our cover. Watch the youngster. Artyom nodded and took Oleg by the hand, nearly tearing the boy away from the stretcher on which his father lay. Let's build the turtle, Melnik ordered. The fighters formed an oval in a moment, sticking out their linked shields, above which only helmets were seen. Four carried the stretcher with their free hands. The boy and Artyom were inside the formation, fully covered by shields. They gagged the old man, tied his hands behind his back, and placed him at the head of the formation. After several strong jabs, he stopped trying to break loose and calmed down, staring sullenly at the floor. The first two fighters, who had special night vision instruments, served as the eyes of the um, turtle. The instruments were fastened directly to the helmets, so that their hands remained free. The party bent down on command, covering their legs with the shields and moved ahead swiftly. Squeezed between the fighters, Artyom held Oleg's hand tightly and pulled him along. He couldn't see anything and could work out what was happening only by the curt discussions. Three on the right, women, a child. On the left, in the arch, in the arch, they're shooting. Needles began to clang on the metal of the shield. Take them out. Machine gun pops were heard in response. There's one, two... Keep moving, keep moving, from behind, Lomov, some more shots. Where, where, don't go there. Ahead, I said. Hold the hostage. Whoa. Damn, it flew right in front of my eyes. Stop, stop, halt. What's there? It's all blocked. There are about 40 people there. Barricades. Is it far? 20 meters. They are not firing. They are approaching from the sides. When did they manage to build barricades? A rain of needles fell on the shields. On signal, they all got down onto one knee so that now the armor covered them completely. Artyom bent down, covering the boy. They placed the stretcher with Anton on the floor. The rain of needles intensified. Do not respond. Do not respond. We'll wait. It hit my boot. Ready the light. On the count of three, flashlights and fire. Whoever has the night vision equipment, choose the targets now. One, how they shoot. Two, three. Several powerful flashlights lit up simultaneously and the machine guns opened up. Somewhere ahead, Artyom could hear the cries and moans of the dying. Then the firing unexpectedly ceased. Artyom listened. Over there, there, with the white flag. Are they giving up or what? Cease fire. We'll talk. Put the hostage in front. Stop, you bastard, there. I've got him. I've got him, smart old man. We have your priest. Let us leave. Melnik called out. Let us return to the tunnel. I repeat, let us leave. Well, what's there? What's there? Zero reaction. They're silent. Maybe they don't understand us. So, hold the light on him for me a little better. Take a look. Then the negotiation suddenly stopped. It was as though the fighters were absorbed in thought. At first it was just those who were at the front... Then the ones covering the rear quieted down. The silence was tense. Not good. What's there? Artyom asked uneasily. No one answered him. 
The people even stopped moving about. Artyom felt the palm of the hand he was holding the boy with start to sweat. It shook him. I feel he is looking at us, he said quietly. Release the hostage, Melnik suddenly pronounced. Hey, release the hostage, repeated another fighter. Then Artyom could bear it no longer, and he straightened up and looked over the shields and helmets. Ahead, ten steps from them, in the intersection of three blinding beams of light stood, not squinting and not shielding his eyes with his hands, a tall, stooped man with a white rag in his extended, gnarled hand. The man's face could be seen clearly. He was similar to Vartan, the one who had interrogated him several hours ago. Artyom ducked behind the shields and released the safety on his machine gun and chambered around. The scene he had just observed remained before him. Simultaneously eerie and bewitching, it suddenly reminded him for a moment of an old book, tales and myths of ancient Greece which he had loved to look at when he was a child. One of the legends told about a monstrous creation in semi-human form whose look turned many brave warriors to stone. He drew a breath, mustered all his willpower, having forbidden himself to look the hypnotist in the face, jumped over the shields like an imp on a spring, and pulled the trigger. After the strange, noiseless battle between machine guns with silencers and blowpipes, the Kalashnikov's salvo seemed to jar the station's domes, although Artyom was convinced it was not possible to miss from such a distance. What he feared most happened. The creature had guessed his intentions, and as soon as Artyom's head appeared above the shields, his gaze fell into the trap of those dead eyes. He succeeded in squeezing the trigger, but an unseen hand deftly pushed the barrel aside. Almost the whole salvo missed, and only one round struck the creature in the shoulder. It issued a guttural sound that pierced the ears, and then, with one elusive movement, disappeared into the darkness. We have several seconds, Artyom thought. Only several seconds. When Melnik's party had broken through to Park Pobody, there had been the element of surprise on his side. But now, when the savages had organized a defense, there was no chance, it seemed, to overcome the barrier created by them. Running the other way remained the only way out. The words of his jailer flashed in his head. Tunnels that are not on the metro map leave the station. Are there other tunnels here? he asked Oleg. There is one more station beyond the passage, just like this one, like a reflection in a mirror. The boy waved a hand. We played there. There are still tunnels like here, but they told us it was forbidden to go there. We are falling back towards the crossing, Artyom bellowed, trying to lower his voice and imitate Melnik's commanding bass. What the devil? The stalker snarled with displeasure. It seemed he had come to his senses. Artyom grabbed him by the shoulder. Quickly! They have a hypnotist there, he began to jabber. We can't penetrate this barrier. There's another exit there, beyond the crossing. True, it's a double, this station. Let's go. The stalker accepted the decision. Hold the barricade back, slowly, slowly. The others slowly, as if unwillingly, began to move. Urging them with new orders, Melnik was able to compel the party to reform and begin the retreat before new needles flew at them from the darkness. When they began to stand up along the steps of the passage, the fighter who was bringing up the rear let out a scream and grabbed at his shin. He continued to climb with his stiffening legs for several seconds, but then a monstrous cramp brought him down, twisted him, as if he were wrung out laundry, and he collapsed onto the ground. The party stopped. Beneath the cover of the shields, two free fighters rushed to lift their comrade from the ground, but it was all over. His body was turning blue before their eyes, and foam was appearing on his gums. Artyom already knew what it meant, and so did Melnik. Take his shield, helmet, and machine gun. Quickly, he ordered Artyom. Let's go, let's go, he screamed to the rest. The titanium helmet was soiled with the awful foam, and he would have to take it from the dead man's head. Artyom was unable to force himself to do it. Limiting himself to the machine gun and shield, he took his place at the rear of the formation, covered himself with the shield, and moved behind the others. Now they were nearly running. Then someone threw a smoke bomb far ahead and, availing themselves of the confusion, the party began to climb down to the tracks. Another fighter cried out in surprise and fell to the ground. Now, only three were able to carry the stretcher with the wounded Anton. Artyom was reluctant to show himself from behind the shield and fired back several times without looking. Then things grew strangely quiet. 
The needles were no longer flying at them, although, judging by the rustle of the steps and voices all around, the pursuit had not ceased. Summoning his courage, Artyom looked out from behind his shield. The party was ten meters from the entrance to the tunnel. The first fighters had already stepped inside. Two, turning, swept the approaches with their lights and covered the rest. But there was no need for it. The savages, it seemed, did not intend to follow them into the tunnels. Crowding around in a semicircle, lowering their pipes and shading their eyes with their hands from the blinding light of the flashlights, they awaited something in silence. Enemies of the Great Worm, listen! The bearded leader appeared from the crowd. The enemies are going into the holy passages of the Great Worm. Good people do not go after them. It is forbidden to go there today. Great danger, death, and damnation. Let the enemies give back the old priest and leave. Don't let him go. Don't listen to them, Melnick commanded slowly. Let's go. They continued moving cautiously. Artyom and several other fighters were moving backwards and not taking their eyes off the station they were leaving behind. At first, no one actually came after them. A voice was heard from the station. Someone was arguing, at first not loudly, but then beginning to scream. Drawn cannot! Drawn must go for the teacher! Forbidden to go! Halt! Halt! A dark figure dashed from the darkness into the beams of the flashlights with such speed that it was impossible to hit it. Immediately behind it, others too appeared in the distance. Not able to target the first savage, one of the fighters tossed something forward. Get down! Grenade! Artyom flung himself onto the ties with his face down, covering his head with his hands, and opened his mouth as his stepfather had taught him. The incredible sound and deafening force of the shock wave hit his ears and pressed him to the ground. He lay there for several minutes, opening and closing his eyes, trying to come to his senses. His head pounded, colored spots circled before his eyes. Clumsy, endlessly repeated words were the first sound he heard after coming to his senses. No, no, don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Drone doesn't have a weapon! Don't shoot! He turned his head and looked around. In the intersection of the beams, with hands lifted high, the savage who had been guarding them while they were imprisoned in the monkey cage stood. Two fighters kept him in their sights, awaiting orders, and the rest got up from the ground and shook themselves. A heavy dust from the rock hung in the air while a pungent smoke crept from the side of the station. What? Did it collapse? Asked someone. From one grenade? The whole metro holds on by a hair? <laughs> well, they won't try to get in here anymore until they get rid of the blockage. That should tie them up. Let's go. There's no time. We don't know when they'll come to their senses, the approaching Melnick ordered. They halted only an hour later. During this time, the tunnel split in two directions, and the stalker, who was walking ahead, chose which way to go. Huge cast-iron loops were seen in one place. Most likely at some time they had strong shutters hanging from them. Next to them was scattered the debris of a pressurized gate. Except for that, nothing of interest was found. The tunnel was completely empty, pitch black and lifeless. They walked slowly. The old man stumbled at every step and several times he fell to the ground. Drone walked unwillingly and mumbled to himself about a prohibition and damnation until they stuffed a gag into his mouth. When the stalker finally allowed them to stop and he had dispatched sentries with night vision instruments fifty meters on both sides, the exhausted priest collapsed to the floor. The savage continued pleading inarticulately through the gag until the escorts brought him closer to the old man and he dropped to his knees in front of him and stroked the old man's head with his bound hands. The young Oleg rushed to the stretcher on which his father lay and began to cry. Anton's paralysis had passed, but he was unconscious, just as after the first needle had struck him. The stalker, meanwhile, beckoned Artyom to his side. Artyom was no longer able to contain his curiosity. How did you find us? I was already thinking, you know, they were going to eat us, he admitted to Melnik. You think it was difficult? You left the hand car right under the hatch. The lookouts noticed it when Anton didn't show up for tea. They just didn't try to poke around in there themselves. They placed a guard and reported it to the chief. You actually didn't wait for me even for a little while. Then I left for Smolenskaya again to the base for corroboration. We assembled at the alarm, but we needed time. 
While we got equipped, I began to remember what's what at Mayakovskaya. It was a similar situation. There was a crumbling side tunnel there as well, where Tretyak and I had separated. We had been looking for the entrance to D6 on the map. We were about 50 meters apart. He, most likely, had got closer to it. I'd been gone for only three minutes. I shouted to him, but he didn't respond. I ran to him. He was lying there, all blue, swollen, his lips cracked by this crap. I grabbed him by the legs and dragged him to the station. While I was dragging him, I recalled Semyonich and his story about the poisoned watchman. I shined my light at Tretyak, and there was a needle in his leg. Then everything began to fall into place. I sent the messenger to you as soon as possible so that you would remain at the station, arrange your affairs, and return. But I was unsuccessful. Are they really at Mayakivskaya, too? Artyom was surprised. But just how did they get there from Park Pobody? This is how they get there. The stalker removed his heavy helmet and placed it onto the floor. You will, of course, forgive me, but we didn't just come for you, but for intelligence as well. I think there must be one more exit to Metro 2 from here. These cannibals of yours also made it through to Mayakovskaya. There, by the way, it's the same story as here. Children disappear from the station at night. And only the devil knows where they get to, and we see neither hide nor hair of them. That is, you want to say... The thought itself had seemed so unbelievable to Artyom that he didn't dare utter it aloud. In your opinion, is the entrance to Metro 2 somewhere around here? Was the gate to D6, that mysterious Metro Phantom, really located in the immediate vicinity? Rumors, stories, legends, and theories of Metro 2 that he had heard throughout his life swirled in Artyom's head. Let me tell you something else, the stalker winked at him. I think we're already in it. It has just been impossible to verify it. Requesting a flashlight from one of the fighters, Artyom began to study the tunnel's walls. He caught the surprised looks of the others, knowing that must look really stupid, but he couldn't help himself. And he only partly understood what had he expected to see on reaching Metro 2. Golden rails? People living as they once had, not knowing about the horrors of present-day existence in fairy tale abundance? Gods? He passed from one lookout to the other, but as he didn't find anything, turned towards Melnik. He was speaking with the fighter who was guarding the savages. What about the hostages? Finish them off? The escort asked casually. First we'll have a little talk, the stalker answered. Bending down, he pulled the gag from the old man's mouth. Then he did the same with the second prisoner. Teacher, teacher, drone is coming with you. I am coming with you, teacher. The savage immediately began to lament, swaying from side to side above the groaning priest. Drawn is violating the prohibition of the holy passages. Drawn is ready to die at the hand of the enemies of the great worm. But Drawn is coming with you to the end. What else is there? What's this about a worm? What about the holy passages? Melnik asked. The old man was silent. Looking at the escorts in fright, Drone hurriedly said, The holy passages of the great worm are forbidden for good people. The great worm may appear there. Man can see it is forbidden to look. Only the priests can. Drawn is afraid, but is coming. Drawn is coming with the teacher. What worm? The stalker wrinkled his nose. The great worm. The creator of life, explained Drone. The holy passages are further. One cannot go every day. There are forbidden days. Today is a forbidden day. If you see the great worm, you will turn to ashes. If you hear him, you will be cursed. You will die quickly. Everyone knows. The elders say so. What? Are all the morons like this there? The stalker looked at Artyom. No, he shook his head. Talk to the priest. Your eminence. Melnik addressed the priest's tongue in cheek. You will excuse me. I am just an old soldier. How best to express it? I don't know haughty language, but here there is one place in your possession that we are searching for. Supposedly accessible. Things are kept there. Flaming arrows? Grapes of wrath? He gazed into the old man's face, hoping that he would respond to one of his metaphors. But the priest stubbornly remained silent, sullenly staring at him from beneath his brows. The hot tears of the gods? The stalker was continuing, to the surprised looks of Artyom and the others, to try get answers. 
Zeus, lightning bolts? Stop playing the fool. The old man finally interrupted him with contempt. There is nothing transcendental to trample with your dirty soldier boots. Missiles, Melnik at once became businesslike. The missile unit, just outside Moscow, an exit from the tunnel by Mayakovskaya. You must remember what I'm talking about. We have to get there right away, and it would be better for you to help. Missiles, the old man repeated slowly, as if testing the flavor of the word. Missiles? You probably are about 50 years old, right? You still remember. They named the SS-18 Satan in the West. It was the only insight of a blind-from-birth human civilization. Are you really so great? You have destroyed the whole world. Are you really so great? Listen, Your Eminence. We don't have time for this. Melnik cut him off. I am giving you five minutes. His fingers cracked as he stretched out his hands. The old man made a face. It was as if neither the combat dress of the stalker and his fighters, nor the poorly concealed threat in Melnik's voice had the slightest impact on him. And what? What can you do to me? He smiled. Torture me. Kill me. Go ahead. I'm already old, and in our faith there are not enough martyrs. So just kill me like you killed hundreds of millions of other people, as you killed my whole world. Our whole world. Go ahead, squeeze the trigger of your damn machine as you press the triggers and buttons of dozens of thousands of different lethal devices. The old man's voice, at first weak and hoarse, quickly turned steely. Despite his matted gray hair, tied hands, and short stature, he no longer looked pathetic. A strange force emanated from him. His every new word sounded more convincing and menacing than the last. You don't have to smother me with your hands. You don't even have to see my agony. You and all your machines will be damned. You have devalued both life and death. Do you consider me a madman? But the true madmen are you, your fathers and your children. Wasn't it really a perilous madness to try to subjugate the whole earth to yourselves, throw a bridle on nature and cause it to cramp and convulse? Where were you when the world was destroyed? Did you see how it was? Did you see what I saw? The sky, at first melting and then engulfed with lifeless clouds? Boiling rivers and seas, expelling onto the shores, creatures boiled alive and then converted into frozen custard? The sun disappearing from the sky, not to reappear for years? Homes turned to dust in a split second and the people living in them turned to ashes? Did you hear their cries for help? And those who died from epidemics and maimed by radiation, did you hear their curses? Look at him. He pointed at Drone. Look at all those without arms, without eyes, with six fingers, even those who have obtained new capabilities. The savage fell to his knees and seized on every word of his priest with awe. And Art Yom himself felt something similar. Even the other soldiers unwillingly took a step back. Only Melnik continued, screwing up his eyes, to look the old man in the eyes. Have you seen the death of this world? The priest continued. Do you understand who is to blame for it? Who converted boundless green forests into scorched deserts? What did you do with this world? With my world? Earth has not known a greater evil than your damned mechanized civilization. Your civilization is a cancerous tumor. It is a huge amoeba, greedily soaking up everything as useful and nourishing and belching out only fetid poison wastes. And now you once more need missiles. You need the most frightful weapons created by a civilization of criminals. Why? In order to complete what you started? Murderers, I hate you, hate you all, he yelled in a rage then had a coughing fit and fell silent. No one breathed a word until he stopped coughing and continued, But your time is coming to an end. And even if I do not survive until then, others will come to replace me. Those will come who understand the perniciousness of technology, those who will be able to manage without it. Your numbers are dwindling and you will not be here much longer. It's sad that I will not see your agony. But we are nurturing sons who will. Man will repent that he destroyed everything of value to him in his arrogance. After centuries of deception and illusions, he finally will learn to distinguish between evil and good, between the truth and a lie. We are cultivating those who will populate the earth after you, and so that your agony is not dragged out, we soon will drive the dagger of mercy into your very heart, into the flabby heart of your rotted civilization, that day is near.
He spat at Melnick's feet. The stalker didn't respond right away. He gave the old man, trembling in his rage, the once over. Then, folding his arms across his chest, asked with interest, And what? You conceived some kind of worm and made up a tale just to inspire your cannibals to hate technology and progress. Shut up. What do you know of my hatred of your damned, of your diabolical technology? What do you understand about people and of their hopes and goals and needs? If the old gods allowed man to go to hell and died themselves along with their world, it makes no sense to revive them. In your words, I hear the bloody arrogance, the contempt, the pride that brought mankind to the brink of disaster. So though there be no great worm, though we dreamed him up, you will very soon be convinced that this fabricated underground god is mightier than your celestial beings. Those idols that tumbled from their thrones and were broken asunder, you laugh at the great worm. Go ahead and laugh, but you will not have the last laugh. That's enough. The gag, the stalker ordered. Don't touch him for now. He may come in handy for us again. They once more stuffed a rag into the mouth of the resisting old man as he cried out obscenities. The savage stood quietly. His shoulders drooped helplessly, but he did not take his lackluster eyes off the priest. Teacher, what's it mean? There is no great worm, he uttered gravely at last. The old man didn't even look at him. What's it mean? The teacher dreamt up the great worm. Drone spoke dully, shaking his head from side to side. The priest did not answer. It seemed to Artyom that the old man had used up all his vital energy and will in his speech and was exhausted now. Teacher, teacher, there is a great worm. Are you misleading them? Why? You are speaking an untruth to confuse the enemies. He exists, exists. Unexpectedly, Drone began to howl. Such despair was heard in his half-wailing, half-crying, that Artyom wanted to approach him to comfort him. The old man, it seemed, already had said adieu to life, and had lost any interest in his pupil. For now other questions troubled him. He exists. He exists. He exists. We are his children. We all are his children. He is and always was and always will be. He exists. If there is no great worm, that means we are completely alone. Something terrifying was happening to the savage who had been left bereft. Drawn went into a trance, shaking his head as if hoping to forget what he had heard emitting the same note, and the tears dropping from his eyes mixed with the drool from his mouth. He didn't even make an attempt to dry himself, snatching with his hands at his shaved skull. The soldiers released him, and he fell to the ground, covering his ears with his hands, striking himself on the head. He began to roll around wildly and uncontrollably, and his screams filled the whole tunnel. The fighters tried to quiet him, but even kicks and blows couldn't stop the howls bursting forth from his breast. Melnick looked with disapproval at the cannibal. Then he unbuttoned the holster at his hip, pulled his stetchkin with the silencer from it, aimed at drone, and pulled the trigger. The silencer gave a quiet bang, and the savage went instantly limp. The inarticulate screaming he had been making stopped suddenly but the echo repeated his last sounds for several more seconds, as if extending Droney's life for a moment. And only now did it begin to occur to Artyom what the savage had screamed before his death. Alone. The stalker slid the pistol back into the holster. Artyom was unable to lift his eyes towards him, looking instead at the silence drawn and the priest sitting not far away. He did not react in any way to the death of his pupil. When the clap of the pistol had sounded, the old man hardly twitched, then looked in passing at the savage's body and turned away with indifference again. Let's go on, Melnick ordered. Half the metro will come running here with all this noise. The party formed up instantly. They put Artyom at the rear, equipped with the powerful flashlight and bulletproof vest of one of the fighters who was carrying Anton. A minute later, they had moved deep inside the tunnel. Artyom was not fit for the role of last man. He moved his legs with difficulty, stumbling on the ties, looking helplessly at the fighter walking ahead. Drone's dying bawling rang in his ears. His despair, disillusionment, and unwillingness to believe that man had been left completely alone in this horrifying, gloomy world had been transferred to Artyom. Strange, 
but only having heard the savage's howl, the full hopeless nostalgia for an absurd, fabricated divine being, he began to understand the universal feeling of solitude that fed mankind's faith. If the stalker turned out to be right, and they had been descending into the bowels of Metro 2 for more than an hour already, then the mysterious structure would turn out to be just an engineering design, cast off long ago by its proprietors and captured by semi-rational cannibals and their fanatical priests. The fighters began to speak in whispers. The party entered an empty station of an extremely unusual design. A short platform, low ceiling, enormously thick columns of ferro-concrete and tiled walls instead of the customary marble indicated that no one had asked that this station be easy on the eyes and its singular mission consisted of protecting as effectively as possible those who used it. Bronze letters on the wall grown dim from time were formed into the incomprehensible word Sovmin. In another place appeared Dom Pravitelstva RF. Artyom knew that there were no stations under those names in the usual metro. Melnik, it seemed, did not intend to hang about here. Quickly looking around, he spoke softly to his fighters about something, and the party moved on. Artyom was overcome with a strange feeling that he was unable to express in words. Unseen observers changed from menacing, wise, and incomprehensible powers into phantasmagorical ancient sculptures, illustrating ancient myths and crumbling from the dampness and draft of the tunnels. At the same time, the other beliefs that he had bumped into during this journey were lost in the gibberish of his consciousness. One of the greatest secrets of the Metro was opening before him. He was walking through D6, called by one of his companions, the Golden Myth of the Underground. However, instead of a wave of happiness, Artyom was experiencing an incomprehensible bitterness. He was beginning to understand that some secrets should remain as secrets because they do not have any answers, and there are questions, the answers to which it is better no one knows. Artyom was aware of the cold breath of the tunnels on his cheek, following the trail of his falling tears. He shook his head just as Drone had done a little while ago. He began to shiver from the dank draft carrying the smell of dampness and desolation, as well as from his feelings of loneliness and emptiness. For a split second it seemed that nothing in the world made sense. His mission and man's attempts to survive in a changed world were worthless. There was nothing, just an empty, dark tunnel he was supposed to plod his way through, from birth station to death station. Those looking for faith had simply been trying to find the side branches in this line, but there were only two stations and only tunnel connecting them. When Artyom gathered his wits, it turned out that he had fallen several dozen paces behind the others. He didn't immediately understand what had forced him to come to his senses. Then looking along the walls and listening closely, he realized on one of the walls hung a loosely closed door through which a strange, increasingly loud sound reached him. It was some kind of a dull murmur or dissatisfied rumbling. It probably hadn't been audible when the others were passing the door. But now, it was becoming difficult not to notice the noise. The others had already moved a hundred meters beyond it. Overcoming the desire to dash after them, Artyom held his breath, approached the door, and shoved it. A long, wide corridor revealed itself. It ended in the black square of an exit. The murmur was coming from there. Increasingly, it sounded like the roar of a huge animal. Artyom did not dare step inside. He stood as if bewitched, staring into the dark emptiness, and listened until the roar had intensified many times, and he saw in the beam of his flashlight something incredibly huge hurtling towards him. He recoiled, slammed the door, and hurried to catch up with the others.